All right, so uh, we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to start out with a uh, talk on VTPM by Joel Shaw. Um, just a couple logistics. Uh, if folks could volunteer to um, help with the notes on Etherpad, if you hover over the, uh, the, the microconf on the uh, plumber site, it'll take you to this Etherpad link. Sorry. Um, we're, we should have a few minutes at the end if anybody wants to do a lightning talk or anything like that. So if you're interested, either come see me or, or Alex. Um, and we do have to be out of this room by 4.45, so um, we're going to shoo everybody out once we hit the time. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joel to talk about VTPM, my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> nice. So Anthony is going to be the heckler for my talk here. If everybody is in like the last three rows, could move a little forward so we can have some conversations, not just for my talk, for the others too. Um, so we're kind of in a situation now where in the past, people who are interested in security would simply buy a physical machine and they wouldn't run virtualized. But now, even those security conscious people are having trouble avoiding the cloud and virtualization. And so a lot of the people who have been railing on this kind of stuff, you know, TPMs and Secure Boot are now coming into QMU and KVM and trying to make this stuff happen in virtualized environments. And so this talk is about one of those technologies. Uh, so there's, there's three developers who've been working on VTPM. Stefan Berger has written a bulk of the code and has been working on this for a longer period of time. And uh, recently, Corey and I, so this year, have been helping Stefan and kind of tag teaming as we have uh, time from our other projects to try and get some of this stuff coded and up to QMU standards and try and get it out on the mailing list and merged. So uh, a TPM is, I assume some of you are familiar, but I'll, I'll go over this for those who aren't. A uh, trusted platform module is it's an open specification. You can go download the specification. You can spend a couple days reading it. It's very in-depth, very, very, uh, very detailed. But um, the thing I'd like to emphasize here is this is not secure boot. This is not Intel TXT. It is completely optional. If you don't use it, it doesn't do anything to you to try and keep you out of your system. If you do use it, um, it has no enforcement policy, so if you install your own things, it doesn't say, oh, the hash doesn't match, I'm not going to install them. It just will let people know that the hash doesn't match if they ask. So it, it does uh, storage of keys. So you can securely store your private keys in case someone hacks your system. They're still safe. It has a good random number generator. There will probably be more discussions about random number generation with recent developments. but. I still think this is a good random number generator. Um, it also does attestation and allows you to do remote attestation. So you can make sure that your binaries are still the binaries that you expect them to be on the disk and you can ensure that consistently from boot to boot and it, it allows someone to log in remotely over the network and uh, verify that as well with some level of assurance. So again, this is not enforcement. TPM is, this is the alternative to the evil things that are trying to lock you out of your machine. So we're not trying to make your lives miserable. So a little bit of history of TPM. So eight and a half years ago, uh, TPM drivers merged into the Linux kernel upstream in 2.6.12. How many people have been doing kernel development since 2.6.12? Oh, we got some old, old kernel hackers in here. So TPM has been around for a very long time in the Linux kernel. There hasn't been too much controversy over it. Um, shortly after that, Zen integrated some uh, VTPM support. I'm not very familiar with what level of integration that is and how well that's supported, but there were some patches. They were apparently merged. Um, a little bit after that, IBM started shipping our first server with a TPM. And uh, shortly after that, a TPM 1.2 spec is published. Uh, six and a quarter years ago, the Department of Defense mandates all new computers have a TPM in them, which 
uh, immediately means that the hardware manufacturers start putting TPMs in most of their hardware, including Intel and AMD and most of your popular server uh, chipset vendors. Uh, Red Hat added it into RHEL in uh, 5.2 beta and subsequent 5 and 6 follow-ons. Uh, SUSE added in SLES, it's also in Ubuntu, I don't remember when it went in. And uh, to make us kind of look bad in QMU, VMware did it as well, which, you know, if VMware is beating us to something, that, that's not usual. All right, give um, it to me, Anthony. The, the first comment is that the, the VTPM support that went into Zen back in 2005 was really just, um, that was Zen PV, obviously, given the date. And the VTPM device was being emulated uh, as a separate sort of um, process over a socket. Um, so it was a, other than merging the BIOS bits, there wasn't really, you know, tight integration. It didn't integrate with live migration. I think there was a disconnect or something because it's Zen PV. So it was sort of a shallow implementate or shallow integration. It's not the sort of thing we could do with QMU. Um, so yeah. Okay. We're not that bad. Uh, that's the we're not that bad. We're, we're just beat by VMware. <laughs> <laughs> so here's kind of uh, an overview of what we have managed to get into QMU today. So this is upstream. Uh, the top box, this is all uh, what would run in the guest, which is exactly the same stack as runs in a physical machine. So, you know, device drivers and trousers and whatever. Uh, in QMU, we have... Uh, a TPM front end, we have some BIOS code, we have some libvirt stuff to manage it, and we have a pass-through back end that will then talk to the normal Linux stack, which if you wrap this back around, it's up there, and then underneath we have some TPM hardware. And this works perfectly fine if you only want to want run one guest per physical machine, or if you want to have one physical TPM for every guest, which is a lot of hardware. But if you're desperate for a TPM, you can do this and run it in a virtualized environment, just one of them. <coughs> uh, which brings us to what we're trying to work on, VTPM. As you can see, this is a lot like the previous slide. There's not too much different. What is different is this. So we keep the same front end. We, all the user space is the same. Uh, now we have uh, libtpms, which is a open source library that is included in most of the distros that you would commonly want to use. <coughs> um, so we set up a call from the front end, make a call into the library, set up um, some callback so it can store into persistent memory in, in the NVRAM, and then that can be migrated around with QMU images. No heckling? Okay, so, so I guess I'll ask the first question. <laughs> Why should we rely on TPM emulation in a library instead of just adding the TPM emulation, in, TPM emulation in QMU like we do for every other device? What makes TPM special? Um, we would be perfectly happy to merge the software emulation directly into QMU as well. I don't think you want to have big piles of crypto code in QMU and maintain them. Uh, it was specifically done in a library here, so it would be easier on people well, like you. I guess some of the, the, the background here is that the libtpms was really written as a reference implementation of the vtpm spec. So it includes every possible feature under the sun, more than hardware would actually do. The question is, do we really need all that? I mean, could we get 90% of the benefit of having a vtpm by having a couple thousand lines of TPM emulation in QMU, as opposed to trying to have a, you know, 100% including all optional implementations of the spec implementation. Is the complexity worth it, so, given that no one uses TPMs in real life? <laughs> that, that's, that's a broader discussion that we can, we can get into, but I think there are people who use it, and I think more people will in the future. But the, the question is, do you want to take an existing library that ships with all the distros and duplicate a subset of that code into QMU? 
is that duplication of code really something that you want to do in QMU? I guess my, my we, we, do, we do do this with uh, QXL already, don't we? I absolutely hate it. Um, <clears throat> so I guess one of the concerns I have about libtpms is who's reviewed that code? So has anybody outside of IBM even looked at that code? I, I mean, you can probably go through the, the commit logs for it. It is open source and available for anyone to look at. You're welcome to go yeah. look at the source for it. It's, it's available. Red Hat yeah. ships source RPMs, and there's a. Yeah, I guess my real concern is I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that it's been vetted to the degree that it would be vetted had. It's not just about you know replicating functionality in QMU, right? Um, if there was a, a widely understood, um, you know, uh, implementation outside of QMU, that'd be one thing. Um, but I'm not sure that's the case with libtpms. So. So I guess the question is, if we take a subset of libtpms functionality and put it in QMU, is it going to get better security review than it does being where it is now? It will at least get review. <laughs> and I'm not convinced that libtpms has gotten any review. I, I would say it has some review, but I understand yeah. there's a limited number of people who are interested in TPM right. software emulation. And, and if anything, code to a great degree. when it comes to security software, sticking it off in a corner by itself where nobody else ever has to think about it is probably not the right approach, right? You probably want it to be something that more people are looking at, more people are reviewing and not just sort of relegating it to, you know, no offense intended, but an obscure library that nobody uses today, right? Yeah, my, my question is, if we put it on QMU Devel, and given the level of review that these simple integration patches have had, which is not super high, how many people who are actually qualified security people will be reviewing it? Oh, I see a question over there. Actually, I'm Mike Warfield. I'm uh, with IBM currently, but I'm one of the founders of the X-Force at I ISS, Internet Security Systems. You're more likely to get a review of an isolated security-specific module. That's going to get the attention of people like me that have an interest in cryptography. I'm not going to go delving down <clears throat> into the entire source of QEMU looking for some obscure crypto bits to see if they're right or not. I think Bruce Schneier has even made the point that you do the crypto, you, you don't reinvent the crypto in a, in a bunch of different places. You, right. you, you make it small modules that are easy to edit, can be verified easily, and whether or not it's an obscure little corner somewhere, burying it in a big, great big emulation blob like QEMU, you're, you're even less likely to get it reviewed. So it's not clear to me that there is sort of crazy math crypto stuff that would need to be reviewed. It's really just consuming the libraries, right? So there's, there's not, you know, kind of the math side of the crypto, but there are a lot of security specific things. I mean, it is a library to emula emulate a TPM which has no other purpose than security. And so, yeah, people who are security minded might be more willing to look at a separated library. Question? Uh, the, the question was what the other consumers of libtpms are and uh, right now it's anyone who's just doing a software only TPM, which from a practical point of view is mostly researchers. So I'm not aware of other current products that are using it. So if this code got merged into QMU, would there be other users who would continue to want to use it as a library? Are there other virtualization systems or something that would want to use libtpms? Uh, it's possible in the future there might be. But there aren't any currently. There aren't. I'm not aware of any currently. Okay. 
All right, I think we've kind of beaten this slide to death. So um, into our specific uh, implementation here. So our original submissions for uh, the, the NV, NVRAM part, which is how we store the persistent state, uh, used a header offset mechanism to store, store it in a QCOW2. And uh, those were sent out and there was feedback on QMU Devel that uh, said, well, we're, we're actually looking at ASN.1 for migration and wouldn't it be great if you wrote an ASN.1 implementation? And uh, by the way, we're doing visitors, so let's make it a ASN.1 visitor so it can be reused throughout QMU. And uh, Stefan went off and implemented an ASN.1 encoder uh, and uh, also made it so that the, the VNV RAM was generic enough that it could be used by other devices in the future that might have need to have NV RAM as part of their device. And after doing that work, which was a great deal of code, feedback, um, I think rightfully so maybe, uh, kind of hated that idea <laughs> and wanted something that looked a whole lot like the original code again. Uh, maybe even more simple than the original code was in the first place. So there was, uh, following that, another rewrite. And so this is uh, kind of the, the last direction for how to do VNVRAM for uh, a VTPM. And I think this is Anthony here, <laughs> is the, the guy in the little curly bracket. And basically it's do it as simple as you humanly possibly can is the summary of this slide. And so no, no reusable, reusability for our future people. They can implement their own NVRAM. We don't need to reuse it. No intelligence, just straight offsets and simplicity. And so we did. Um, this was a patch that was sent out in June to kind of implement the VNVRAM because we didn't want to go rewrite the rest of the back end to use it and then someone hates the, this part. And uh, so this got sent out to the mailing list and there is a little back and forth and I think the summary is that people believe they can't review this until we have the back end that uses it. Which is uh, kind of a pain because the back end to use it takes a lot of rewrite to make it work from the ASN1 visitor to this kind of simple thing. I mean, it's a very simple principle that code that isn't used isn't tested, so I won't merge code that doesn't have users. I can understand that. So. So the, the libtpms backend is basically a, a wrapper that maps TPM calls and lib TPMS calls and uh, sets up the persistent storage, which we're referring to as our virtualized NVRAM. And it needs to be uh, migratable and it needs to be able to also have some state to be able to restart operations that were in flight when migrations happened. So if you made a call into your VTPM and you get migrated in the middle of it, then you don't want, you, you don't want to lose that. You want to be able to restart it or at least send back a, a failure and have the user restart it. Um, so the, the libtpms backend is uh, being completely rewritten for I think the third or fourth time now <coughs> to the, the simplified VNVRAM and the work is going slowly, uh, basically because all three of us who are on that second slide have other projects we work on as well and kind of are dubious that QMU actually wants VTPM after the feedback we've been receiving. Okay, so, so, so let's talk about this a little more because I think the thing that should come out of this session is a very clear idea about how to move forward with VTPM, yeah. right? So. From, from an upstream point of view, if we depend on a library, we are responsible for fixing bugs in that library, right? So we depend on glib, and if we ran across a glib bug, we would either have to work around it or we'd have to go into glib and fix it. And both of these scenarios have happened in the past, right? 
So just because something's a dependency, it doesn't mean that we can wash our hands of it, not have not worry about it, and pretend like it doesn't exist. So um, for things like glib, for things like GDK that are widely used, widely reviewed, and clearly have a purpose in the world beyond just QMU, it makes all the sense in the world to use those libraries, right? I think the issue I have fundamentally with T VTPM is all of the arguments that you would make for VTPM can be equally made about VGA emulation or IDE emulation or SCSI emulation. Um, and clearly, you know, as, as someone who cares about QMU, I don't want all of QMU to be a thousand different libraries that are maintained in a thousand different ways, right? So I really struggle with understanding what makes TP, VTPM special um, and that it needs to be, um, you know, a separate library and that it shouldn't be part of QMU. I, I sort of see it like a perpetual out of tree module for the Linux kernel, right? Um, you know, it's, you know, you would never do, you would never have a SCSI layer that was outside of the kernel that was maintained independent of the main tree because it's fundamentally what the kernel does, right? Um, so I haven't heard the answer to that, I guess, and that's what I will ask you here is, you know, other than the fact that the code exists and nobody wants to try to get it merged or rewrite it or whatever, What's the argument for keeping this particular type of device out of QMU? So I, I would say we were doing it because we thought that would kind of be the preference of the QMU uh, community because there are not a lot of cryptography people. There aren't people who know about TPMs. And so it made sense to have that separate because all of the virtualization people generally aren't TPM crypto kinds of people. What, why, I mean, I feel like crypto is being used as a sort of a, a almost, I shouldn't say this, but I will anyway, as a FUD kind of statement where, oh, you can't possibly review this code because it's crypto, but it's not like you're implementing crypto algorithms in libtpm for the most part. You're parsing a, a, a message protocol handing the bits off to a crypto library and calling it a day. So um, maybe we're not as smart as crypto people, but I think we're smart enough to review that kind of code. So, so let, me, let me flip the question back around. If we came and had you know, an NVRAM implemented in the kind of simple way you suggested, and we had the back end imp implemented with that, and we took all the libtpms functionality we're using and submitted that as part of our patch, is that something that would you know, have a chance of getting into QMU. If, if there was a... A, and you've got five minutes. Um, yes, it would. Now, if that is a 90,000 line patch, the answer is no effing way. Um, but if it was a... Uh, VTPM is about 90,000, the less I looked at it. Um, but... I mean, that, like I said, it's a, it's a full implementation of the specification. It's every optional feature. I don't think that that is necessary to get useful functionality. We don't implement every possible SCSI command. Um, we don't implement every possible VGA state, right? Um, you know, so I, I think that in a lot of ways, libtpms is, uh, is sort of too complicated for its own good. It, it's too thorough for its own good, at least in terms of what we do in QMU. So. Yeah. so so my kind of fear here is if we go off and spend several hundreds of hours taking the libtpms stuff, you know, making it look like QMU code and act like QMU code and taking away all the, the optional things, and we're still going to have a very decent sized chunk of code because it's a pretty complex system. I have a hard time believing that. I mean, there's a lot of complex systems that we emulate in QMU. Um, you know, is it really more complicated than VGA that has a, a you know, almost a 30-year history of legacy where it's CGA, VGA, SVGA, Visa, and all of these other things? Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I don't understand what makes TPM so much more fundamentally complicated than these other systems that we emulate today. Okay. So, kind of what you're saying is, you want to see patches that include all of the, the libtpms functionality in the back end. I did not say 
<laughs> the the <laughs> functionality that's useful, right? So like the question would be, what do you need in order to be well? First, what do you what do you want to use a TPM for? So if you want to use a TPM to do UEFI secure boot, or I guess you don't even use a TPM for that. Um, but you know, pick a use case. What are the commands needed? Key storage. Right. Yeah. But pick a use case. Um, you know, implement those commands and go from there, right? Um, and a use case isn't having a dev TPM that supports every optional command in a TPM spec, right? And that's not useful in and of itself. So. I'm not sure I agree that it's being actively maintained. So, like I said, one of the concerns I have, and the question was, what's the cost of forking? Um, you know, this code isn't being used anywhere, um, as far as I know. So it doesn't have a community. It doesn't. It's just code that sort of was thrown over a wall, um, as far as I can tell. There, there is some active maintainership, but it is not as much of a community-driven project as some others yet. I think it will get there as people start using TPMs, and especially in virtualization. But, uh, get updated when there's updates to the TPM spec? Yes, yes, actually the, so TPM 2.0 is uh, out as the spec. There's a TSS 2.0 software spec that's currently being developed with that. Um, the expectation is that the code for that spec, when the spec comes out, will be also released under similar licenses. And it, it, this uh, has evolved from TPM 1.0, 1.1, 1 1.2. It's kept up pretty well with that. All the sorts of things that we do in QMU and around device emulation, um, now we have to get patches merged into libvtpm anytime we want to change you know, something about how we interact with devices. Yes. Well. Wow. <laughs> TPMs are not about performance. Uh, so does anyone who's not Anthony have a question? <laughs> Just to give some other people a chance. I mean, part of working with the crypto library isn't necessarily the crypto itself, but even just using it properly. So, like, OpenSSL is kind of a good and bad example of the API is really complicated and it's really easy to do it wrong. So you don't need to be a crypto person to screw it up completely, even though OpenSSL itself, you know, does the crypto correctly. And when it comes to the library itself and talking about forking, and because there's worry about the upstream not being a viable one, I mean, What's the cost of doing it now and not forking and then finding out, you know, a couple years down the road, maybe not even that long, that, oh, it isn't a viable upstream, so now let's talk about pulling it in. I mean, what's the cost of just not pulling it now, and if upstream is viable, well, then it's viable, so we don't have to do the work. I mean, part of that is the experience of, you know, is it not working out? I mean, he's done the work, it's no, viable no, no, now. No, 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 just to be clear, there haven't been patches posted to the mail address that integrate with PDM, PDMS that solve all the problems around migration and threading and interaction with features. That's not where we are today. So it's not that there is a, this is a sort of a proven solution. We're just saying, oh, no, we don't want to do it without the tree. This is more forward looking. 
But no, I mean, is, the, is the hang up there the VTPM implementation, or is that the library with TPMS? I don't, I don't know in terms of, not to change subjects, but there was another question in terms of functionality. Uh, in Chrome OS, we wanted to have a, we have TPM code that's not really tested other than on actual hardware. Yeah. And we've been just kind of sitting on our hands being like, it would be really great if QMU had this so we could yeah. run actual tests. Um, yeah. well, I, I don't know the commands off the top of my head. I have to go back and find. <laughs> All right, I think we've kind of run out of time, but if anyone has further questions, you can ambush me in the hall during the breaks and that kind of thing. And thank you very much. Thanks, Joel.